phenomenon that um, other countries are looking at a little um, curiously. Uh, but uh, that, that's what the rules are in England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. OK, they do say try to avoid it if you can. Bev uh, asks, if people are expected to self-isolate for holidays already booked, is this class a sick leave? Oh, well, you might have a very generous um, employer, Bev, but I think it's extremely unlikely. There's so many people who this quarantine is causing so much anxiety for because it, for an awful lot of people, it's simply impossible. You can't spend two weeks uh, self-isolating after your trip, which is one reason why you had companies like Jet2 today saying we're cancelling the first two weeks of July um, because they realise that people simply won't want to go away and they're hoping that the quarantine will be lifted in some form um, by the middle of uh, July. So it's not class as sick leave? It won't be, um, and I'm afraid uh, you... Well, yeah, bad luck. OK, Michael wants to know, if the Foreign Office lifts its travel ban, will the government refund people who can't quarantine? Uh, certainly not. And this is a really good reminder from Michael that, of course, all of this talk of quarantine is sort of slightly academic because there's still Foreign Office advice against non-essential travel anywhere abroad. Now, I'm expecting that to be lifted in the next week or so. Um, but unfortunately, anybody who, because of pre-existing conditions, because of their age or whatever, cannot now travel. That's a matter for insurance rather than the government. OK, lots of people have contacted us to say they don't want to go on booked holidays this year. Jane is one of them. She says she has flights booked for Tenerife in August, but feels it won't be safe. She wants a refund. Can she get one? Uh, I suggest that she talks to the travel company, but I suspect if it's just an airline, they'll say, no, the, the flights are here. The fact you don't want to go isn't our problem. Some of them are offering flexibility. Others are simply saying, no, nope, if you're not on board, uh, we're keeping your money. It's really, really harsh. OK, a couple of quick questions from Alison and Amy. Alison wants to know about internal flights. Will they be up and running anytime soon? Amy wants to know, can she travel on the train from the southwest to Manchester to see her family? I guess these are sort of very similar questions. There's still plenty of domestic flights going on between England and Scotland and Northern Ireland and so on, but I can't carry, catch them for, for fun, unfortunately. And the same would apply with trains. And indeed, those of us who don't have a car are feeling kind of really quite hard done by because we're not allowed to use public transport. So I'm limited to as far as I can cycle on my bike and still get back on the same day. At least you're keeping fit, though. Simon, for now, thank you very much. And we will have more from Simon a little later. Next, a guide to which countries could be open to British visitors if the UK's travel ban is lifted soon. The Foreign Office imposed a ban on all but essential travel in April. There's no indication as to when that ban will be lifted. The new quarantine rules that start today mean anyone travelling abroad will need to stay home for 14 days when they arrive back. But some countries around the world are opening up for tourists and if the ban is lifted, some would welcome British holidaymakers. Italy reopened last week with no need to quarantine. Greece originally banned UK tourists but has now said they will be able to visit from as early as next Monday. But you may be screened for Covid on arrival and may have to quarantine. Iceland and Austria will also reopen in mid-June, but tourists need to test negative for COVID at the airport. For Portugal, it's likely to be the end of June, and the country is currently in talks with the UK for a so-called air bridge, meaning you wouldn't need to quarantine when you get back. Spain doesn't expect to welcome British visitors until infection rates have improved. France also doesn't want UK tourists until at least July and says everyone would have to quarantine on arrival. British tourists are still banned from travelling to America and for those looking forward to a trip to South Africa, international tourists won't be welcome until next year. With so much uncertainty, it's also an extremely worrying time for the travel industry. Hayes Travel became the UK's largest travel retailer when it bought Thomas Cook branches last year, saving thousands of jobs. It's also been ranked second in a Martin Lewis money-saving expert survey of more than 50 holiday companies and airlines rated for their customer service during the pandemic. I asked Irene and John Hayes how they'd helped their customers. Um, I think two ways. The first one was that we brought lots of our staff back. Now we brought more than 3,000 people back. That's the first thing, just really to try and resolve issues for our customers. And the second thing is that we've introduced something called the peace of mind guarantee 
we know that there are two things our customers are concerned about. One is their safety and the other is their financial security. So our peace of mind guarantee ensures um, that if for any reason they book a holiday with us and they want to change it or they want to cancel it completely, we will give them every penny of their money back uh, up to six weeks in advance. So we think that gives lots of reassurance and lots of peace of mind. John, what's your advice to anyone uh, watching tonight who's struggling to get refunds from other companies, including airlines? Is it just to be patient? I'm afraid so. <clears throat> it's a really uh, difficult situation for the whole uh, travel industry. And so they are entitled to a re refund. And I know it's uh, very frustrating for, for, for people, but I think be, be patient and, and hang on in there. You've never made anyone redundant uh, in the company's history. What steps have you taken to try to protect jobs now, including the jobs that you saved when you took over Thomas Cook's stores last year? Well, we, we've tried to make sure that in addition to them supporting our customers, they uh, to actually either refund or to rebook or to take a credit note, um, those 3,000 staff are also now selling holidays. And over the last two weeks, uh, we've sold approximately 25% of the number that we were doing like for like last year. Now, as soon as that provides a revenue stream, that obviously safeguards the employment of all of those people who are incredibly eager to help us sell those holidays. I bet they are. You've also had to put some staff on zero hours contracts. Is that right? Yes, we've taken advantage of the government's bolo scheme where appropriate. It's a quite a small percentage of our overall uh, workforce and where appropriate, we've needed to put people on zero hours uh, contracts. But our intention is to avoid uh, uh, redundancies at, uh, at all costs. You had to change the way you worked as well. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, as you can see, we're now sitting in our kitchen. So we... Uh, are doing everything else that, that everybody else is doing, Zoom calls, team calls, Skype calls. Um, but we're also changing the way that our, our people are working with our customers. So our customers can speak to our staff on the phone or they can book a Zoom appointment if they want to. And we have live chat and we have emails. So we think that it'll change the way we do business for a very long time to come. And briefly, uh, have you got a crystal ball? Do you think people will get abroad this summer, later this year? Unfortunately, we don't have a crystal ball, unfortunately. Uh, we're hopeful that uh, the government, well, we're told that the government is in serious discussions with the Spanish, uh, Portuguese, Greek and Italian governments. Uh, so when this uh, three week quarantine period ends, Hopefully from the start of July, there'll be bilateral uh, movement with those, with those countries. If that happens, it'll be great. We know there's loads and loads of demand out there. Uh, just from the volume we're doing of new, brand new bookings we're doing now. So uh, hopefully that will happen, in which case um, uh, people should be able to enjoy their summer holidays, which will be great. Well, enjoy the next holiday you guys managed to get. John and Irene Hayes, thank you very much for speaking to me. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Thank you. Still to come, are you ready to wear your face mask on the trains and buses? Dr Sarah Jarvis has the latest advice for you. And... We clap to an empty boatyard and it just doesn't yeah. have quite <laughs> the same uh, feeling of community. What's it like to lock down on a holiday island, the British couple on their very own Greek odyssey?
Welcome back. Time now to catch up with Dr. Sarah Jarvis. Good evening to you. Let's start with a question from Peter who asks, I don't understand the quarantine from Europe as the death rate is lower than ours. It must be safer to holiday in a European country than to stay in England. We heard Simon talking about that earlier. What's your thoughts on that, Dr. Jarvis? Well, actually, you're probably absolutely right. Now, the theory is that when we have a lot of, of, of coronavirus circulating in the population, that the proportion of cases being brought in from abroad is going to be relatively small. The idea is that once we've got that number down and it's staying down, that the relative importance of people bringing coronavirus in from abroad is going to be much higher. But as you so rightly say, there's not a lot of sense if they're coming in from countries where the cases are much lower than they are in the UK. OK, let's hear now from Brian, who has a question about public transport. My question is, on Merseyside, the Arctic number is above one. Yet we're being told to wait until Monday the 15th of June to wear masks on public transport and when going into hospitals as a visitor or an outpatient. Why not now, every time we leave our homes, shouldn't we wear masks? Yeah, why not now? OK, so, Brian, lots of elements to that. The first is that you're in Merseyside, which is in the northwest, and the University of Cambridge and Public Health England have suggested that the, our number might be 1.01 there and about one down the southeast. The rest of the country is a little bit lower, about, about 0 0.9, 0 0.85. Now, there is some variation across that, so it could be below one, but it could be above, and that's a concern because that means that case numbers could start going up, and they're already fairly high in the northwest. As you probably know, in fact, the government does recommend that you wear face covering, strongly recommends you wear face covering in areas where you can't socially distance and you're indoors. And that includes public transport and some shops. They've mandated it from the 15th of June. Their rationale is that at that stage, things are there's the potential for things to get much worse as more shops open up. And therefore, there are far more people who are together. But you're absolutely right. My feeling is you don't need to wear them every time you need to leave the house. There is little or no benefit in wearing a face mask when you're outside or when you can socially distance, and particularly when you're outside and you can socially distance. However, since they don't protect you if you're wearing a face covering, but they protect other people around you, we really need everybody to be wearing them in order for them to make a difference. My preference would have been if they were going to bring in a requirement, they should have brought it in straight away. And my personal feeling is they should very strongly have let the hospitals know before they did it. OK, let's uh, turn to Henry. He's looking ahead. Uh, let's hear his question. My wife and I love going on cruises. And when cruises return, we have a big concern, not only on social distancing, but the air conditioning, as I believe that they only use 25% of fresh air and the rest is recycled. I wonder if you have any answers for me of whether it's safe to go on a cruise or is it too dangerous? Yeah, have you an answer for uh, Henry there, Sarah? Well, Henry, it kind of all depends is the answer. There does seem to be some evidence that it could be spread through air conditioning. But interestingly, it's only a very small number of cases. There was a restaurant in China where people from three nearby tables were infected. But the restaurant turned out not to have really efficient filtering systems going outside and they had no ventilation at all. Now, I'm very conscious, however, that in, on cruise ships, some of the areas, some of the rooms are very, very small and they're not going to be recirculating the air. So I think there will be some degree of risk. Ventilation is most definitely a very effective way of getting things going. But my feeling is that if air conditioning is good and they've got adequate filters, that the risk will not be enormous from cruise ships. But it will certainly be much less, that, sorry, much higher rather, than it would be if, for instance, you were up on deck or in a holiday where you could much more easily get outside in the open air. OK, Dr Sarah Jarvis for now. Thank you very much. Simon's still with me. Um, the issue of refunds hasn't gone away since you uh, were last here. Steve says he paid £17,000 to take all his grandchildren to Florida in April. He cancelled it in March. He's still waiting for a refund from Virgin. What's your advice? Right, this will be Virgin Holidays, um, who, like pretty much the rest of the travel industry, is having an extraordinarily difficult time. Mm. Um, bear in mind that these companies exist to send millions of us on great holidays. They've had to turn into machines for 
uh, paying us all back the money that um, we, we paid them for holidays, which are now not going ahead. And they're having to do that while their staff are um, maybe furloughed, maybe um, working from home with a laptop and a mobile phone. So it's incredibly difficult. The law is perfectly clear. He should have got his money back within two weeks of the holiday being cancelled. Um, in practice, Virgin say they're trying for uh, 45 days, so it's about uh, six or seven weeks um, to get money back, but um, that is proving tricky in some cases. And also, if you're booked with Virgin Holidays up to and including the 19th of July, they've just cancelled all their trips okay. um, because of the uh, continuing restrictions. OK, so uh, be patient for refunds. Um... Sue, Rob, Kenneth and many, many others want to know why they can't go caravanning. Uh, three points. The static caravan owners, caravan owners aren't getting their site fees refunded. As many viewers uh, say the caravans are three metres yeah. apart, two to three metres apart. And those with mobile vehicles want to know what's the difference between travelling in that and the car. Well, who knows? Um, it's extraordinary the way that um, some uh, communities like caravanners have been completely forgotten um, when it is absolutely clear to me that if you've got a static caravan on a site with its own facilities, then there's no reason that I can see why you can't just go and enjoy being in your property. Um, and I've certainly been um, doing what I can to, to press for people to be able to do that. And in terms of, of touring in your own caravan, I guess that's all part of the you can't go on holidays quite yet. Um, but I know there's a huge amount of frustration. And indeed, the caravan park owners, they don't want simply to be taking money and not offering people um, the chance to use their place. So I hope it will happen very soon. OK, a quick one about um, travel insurance. Mary says, I understand that in future travel insurance companies will not be covering anyone contracting coronavirus. Where does that leave of us, those who love to travel? Ten seconds, I'm afraid. OK, if you're travelling in Europe before the end of the year, then your European health insurance card is still going to cover you for treatment. And there are now policies going onto the market which will cover you for coronavirus if you're abroad. Simon, thank you very much. And Simon will join me with Dr Sarah Jarvis online straight after the show. He'll have advice for boat owners in the UK who can't travel at the moment. But what if you spent lockdown on a boat in Greece? Sucks to be you. Let's hear from one couple, the bloggers to get lost, who did just that. Hey guys, I'm Adam. I'm Emily. And we recently sold everything we owned with the dream of sailing around the world uh, on a vintage, fairly shonky sailboat. We'd done sort of six months of sailing around uh, Sicily and Greece and then come to take the boat out of the water and to do work on her to fix her up. Then obviously mm. COVID happened. Greece then announced 14 days of quarantine, so... Not allowed to leave. Couldn't go and buy food. But at one point we had a little electric kettle and we'd rigged it up and we were trying to distill water into a baking tray and... Um, yeah, we're yeah, not, we're not Bear Grylls. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing on the news about people clapping for the NHS, you know, hearing about people we knew who'd caught it and were sick and just knowing that whatever happened, we couldn't, couldn't get back, we couldn't come and see them. We clapped in an empty boat yard and it just doesn't yeah. have quite <laughs> the same uh, feeling of community and feeling of um, being able to help, I suppose. Almost the opposite. It sounds so cheesy, but you do have to just seize your dreams and because you don't know what will happen tomorrow. Because sometimes we, we, you know, we survive on not very much and, you know, there'll be points where we're trying to fish for our dinner and not spend any money and... I think it, it made us, it made us very thankful for the things that we do have. Mm. We want to cross the Atlantic like Emily's grandmother did. Um, One day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it's, we have some work to do on the boat first. Um, we should probably fix a couple of leaks before we go. <laughs> Goodness, lucky Adam and Emily. Thanks uh, once again for all your brilliant questions. There'll be more of them online next and next Monday at 8. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.
Welcome back to Coronavirus Q&A online tonight with Dr Sarah Jarvis and the travel expert and writer and broadcaster Simon Calder. Thank you both for joining me. Simon, uh, I've got so many questions to get through with you that we didn't squeeze into the programme. Let's start with looking ahead to what travel might look like in the future. B&S in Essex want to know what sort of experience they can expect at the airport ahead of their holiday in September. They want to know, will shops, bars, eateries be open? What about social distancing on the transit train at the gate? and on the plane itself? Well, look, anybody who thinks that passenger aviation and social distancing are compatible is, I'm afraid, uh, greatly mistaken. Um, you are going to have to, after all, you know, we got used to the idea of not going closer than two metres to strangers, you're going to be packed into a plane with 180 people you do not know. Um, the economics of aviation don't allow for social distancing. And so therefore, it's going to look and feel very different. You might well have a temperature check when you go into the airport. You'll certainly be asked to wear a mask and going through security is going to look and feel a bit different. They are trying to do social distancing, but of course, ultimately, you, you, it, the airport experience is all about processing lots and lots of people very quickly in a very confined space. In terms of uh, restaurants, there will be sort of basic um, facilities available, but I'm afraid once you get onto the plane, that's going to continue to be basic. They will be serving a very reduced uh, range of uh, food and drink if you get anything at all. Goodness, you will need a holiday after all that, <laughs> won't you? Um, David has paid for a package holiday to Greece. He asks, if the route reopens, but I can't travel because I am shielding, Will I be entitled to a full refund? Uh, well, you might find that your travel insurer says that you can. You might find that your travel company says, it's all right, Dave, you can postpone until next year. If neither of those apply, you're certainly not going to get a full refund. But what you can do is transfer the holiday to somebody else. It costs roughly £50 per person to get the names changed. And this only applies for proper package holidays. It won't work for flights. You'll end up paying far more than that. OK. Um, Ryanair said today it won't cancel flights where people are booked and can't travel because of the quarantine rules that we discussed earlier. What is your advice for people in that situation? I, I'm just really, really sorry. Um, there is absolutely nothing to stop Ryanair saying you booked this flight. The fact that you don't want to travel because um, you don't feel like two weeks in solitary confinement when you get back isn't our problem. Um, they are simply applying the terms and conditions that applied when you booked the trip. It does seem really unfair. If there's a really good medical reason why you shouldn't be tra travelling, then you can try travel insurance. But I'm afraid it's you know, travel companies. Some of them are imposing their conditions, which they're perfectly legal to do. Uh, allowed to do um, however harsh it seems. Okay. Lauren says, I'm due to fly to Mallorca on the 19th of August this year. Ooh. She says her travel company is TUI, haven't yet cancelled her holiday. She says the death rate in Mallorca is 208, 208, and the total infection rate is uh, just over 2,000, which is low in comparison to the UK. Will I still be able to go? I, I'd say I'm 98% confident. Um, TUI, by the way, will, if you've got a holiday booked, allow you to change it um, if it's booked any time up to the end of August. But I'm really confident that there will be ways around this um, uh, quarantine that will be found by then, uh, frankly, because if they don't, then <laughs> the entire travel industry is toast. They've got to get a decent August. That's the key month. And um, so I'm delighted that she's still keen to go ahead. I'm sure it'll work, work out on a wonderful holiday. It's hard for people in Scotland, isn't it? Because their summer oh, yeah. holidays come uh, much earlier than those in England. Uh, Massafar asks, so he's looking ahead. Is it likely we will be able to go on pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia by December? Well, I'm fairly optimistic. I was actually in Saudi Arabia um, in March when everything started closing down and they're taking this very, very seriously. But of course, uh, it is the key pilgrimage destination and they very much want to open up when they think it is safe to do so. But obviously the Umrah, the, the Hajj are going to feel very different from uh, normal when, when uh, they are allowed to resume. OK, not everyone wants to go abroad right now or at any point. We've had a question here from Tim. He says, most people are allowed to visit other places by car and get out and have a walk around. With many harbours and marinas not allowing recreational boats to moor up for the day, boat users can go nowhere. 
There are relatively few, few of us, so please can this rule be relaxed soon? Any news for boat owners? Look, I'm afraid it's a bit like, I'm oh, sorry to, 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 to don't, don't want to feel like a victim, but I can't go anywhere because I don't have a car. I've just got a bicycle. I can't use public transport. It's one of these um, annoying rules that particularly on beautiful weekends, you just want to, 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 to be enjoying your, your, your boat, but you can't. Um, and I'm sorry, uh, it's one of those things where I hope sense will prevail that a, a, a boat fully enclosed outdoor as well mm. um it's a, a really safe place for people to be yeah self-contained space uh, mm. right uh, barbara uh, has written in uh, with a question for you she says i'm due to go on holiday on july the 28th to turkey will the holiday still go ahead what does your crystal ball say oh, i'm 90 percent confident um turkey looks as though it's going to be opening up roughly uh, middle of july which is when i'm kind of getting signals we might see the quarantine rules reduced sufficiently so that every country from Turkey via Cyprus, Greece, Croatia, Italy, Malta, France, Spain to Portugal um, will all have a deal in place, a so-called air bridge, which will allow us to circumvent uh, the quarantine rule. So, yeah, 90 percent. So would you book right now or just look right now? I'm really keen on people booking trips if they feel that you know, they're happy. We, we heard during the programme from the Hayes family and they got a fantastic deal. You know, if you, if you don't feel like, like your trip, then that's fine. We will get you a refund. Um, if you are prepared to commit, it's great because the travel industry desperately needs your help. But also rationally, um, with so many people, including me, playing, I guess, lockdown refund bingo mm. with lots of travel companies still yeah. owing money, you're reluctant or maybe unable to... Um, uh, put more money into travelling. What happens if you are booked on a holiday and the rules change? So, for example, if the government's travel ban is lifted and then it's locked down again because the R rate yeah. suddenly goes up, or if the quarantine laws change, so if there's an air bridge between the UK yeah. and Greece and that changes, where do you stand in terms of getting flown back and your travel insurance? Because you booked it in good faith when the rules yeah. were OK. Uh, it, uh, that, that is a completely grey area. If you're on a package holiday, that is the safest place to be because then the travel company is absolutely responsible for you. If you say we're going Greek island hopping and you just book flight only, that gets trickier. Um, I'm afraid we are all discovering extraordinary new circumstances that most legislation and certainly most travel insurance policies simply weren't written for no and then you've got to have the discussion with the people that you work for if yeah. you're having to quarantine when you weren't thinking you were going to uh, let's end with a question from rebecca um she says we are due to drive to portugal from the uk on the 9th of july we will of course have to drive through spain while spain isn't allowing british tourists does this include by car also even if we are simply passing through without stopping overnight look if it's in july i think that that's going to be okay um but unfortunately, anything which involves going through um, other countries, crossing extra borders, makes, comp makes travel in these difficult times yet more complicated, which is why, say you were going to um, Italy, I'd strongly recommend flying simply to avoid having to uh, cross borders which may or may not be open. Well, that's my interrailing trip for the year cancelled. <laughs> thank you, Simon, for ending on such a sad note for me personally and my family. Simon Calder, thank you very much for joining me and uh, all that expertise to all this uh, wide range of questions. Uh, obviously, those questions will keep on coming as uh, we really enter the holiday season. Uh, thank you so much. Right, Dr Sarah Jarvis, if I can uh, rejoin you, if that's OK. Um, We'll go back to this issue of face masks on public transport that become yeah. mandatory from next week. Sophie writes, I am severely hard of hearing and uh, wearing two powerful hearing aids. I struggle with masks over faces to hear people and I can't read their lips if covered. Her question is, is there anything you, Sarah Jarvis, could suggest to allow us all to hear clearly or read lips? My goodness, just an, another thing that uh, many people <sighs> won't have even thought about. You're absolutely right. And of course, Sophie, the government has said that if you're disabled, you don't have to wear a face covering. However, that's going to do you no good at all if it's other people who are wearing face coverings, which cause a problem for you. Unfortunately, they will be wearing that face covering for your protection. And while I do understand that, for instance, if you had hearing, hearing aids, which made it difficult for you to wear a face covering, which went round your ears, you could wear one that went over the back. 
unfortunately, I think it's highly unlikely the regulations are going to change because it would have to be everybody that you came into contact with who would be, have, who would be having to take their face covering down. Goodness, so many people will have to be reliant on other people, um, which is very hard for people who want to be independent. Um, Carol has another question about the practicalities of face masks. She says, how do I stand about wearing a mask on public transport? I don't drive, so I have to travel by bus if I go out. I have breathing problems and I can't breathe wearing one. Well, there isn't complete clarity on that, Carol. What I've already said is that we have got regulations which say that if you're disabled, you don't need to wear one. I would assume that people will use their discretion, that staff will use their discretion if somebody isn't wearing one and they explain that it is because they have breathing problems. Now, what it might be worth your while doing just to be on the safe side, perhaps, is to carry a letter or to carry a prescription or your inhalers, which would at least make it clear. Clearly, we don't want to be putting doctors to extra trouble at the moment. But if you carry your inhaler with you, you might be able to show any member of the team that you did have a breathing condition. That would be probably up to them because there is no clarity what the government means by people who are disabled will be exempted from wearing them. OK, Margaret says uh, this is mandatory. So where do we pick up our free face masks from? I am on universal credit. Well, Margaret, you're not required to wear a face mask and you're not required to buy one. It is very simple to make a face covering. You would need two pieces, two layers of material which are uh, non-porous. So in other words, you can't see through them when you hold them up to the light. An old T-shirt or anything like that would do. And there is a very good indicator on gov.uk, a very good guide to making your own face coverings. I'm afraid they are not going to be available uh, through the NHS or anything else. And specifically, they don't want you to be wearing surgical masks, which should be being kept for members of the health and social care professions. Uh, Sarah, do you think we'll move to three layer face masks as we saw the WHO advice change over the weekend that uh, they're now recommending for some people the three layers rather than two? It's possible. We're not recommending that in the United Kingdom at the moment. There is not that much difference. In fact, quite frankly, in terms of how effective they are, it is far, far more important that people wear them properly, that they put them on properly and take them off properly, and that they don't take them off when they want to light a cigarette or take them down in order to speak or do all those other things that we see people doing. And very importantly, it is absolutely not a substitute for social distancing where you can. It is not as effective as that in a community setting, not as effective as social distancing and not as effective as regular hand washing. I think of you every time I take a mask off and you doing that and you telling us on, on a programme a long time ago about take it off carefully. A uh, quick one from Lynn. She says, I don't want to go on holiday. I want to cuddle my children and grandchildren. I mean, this is where we're at at the moment, isn't it? I know it is so, so difficult. But the simple fact of the matter is if you've got grandchildren, the chances are that unfortunately you are vulnerable. And a piece that came out from Public Health England, which looked at all the cases in the United Kingdom just in the last couple of days, has shown very, very clearly that, for instance, at the two ends of the spectrum, under 40s are 70, seven zero times less likely to die from coronavirus on average than over 80s. And we're talking about 50 times more likely if you're in your 70s. So unfortunately, when they recommend that you shouldn't be cuddling, it is for your own protection. Uh, Dr Jarvis, let's uh, leave you with one that's uh, away from uh, travelling. Uh, we have obviously been inundated with lots of questions and we'll get to, to more of those next week. Michael has a question for you. Let's listen to Michael's question. Do I have to isolate for 14 days after I have an MRI scan on Wednesday? I'm not quite sure. Can you please answer that? Yeah, these uh, more routine hospital appointments are now going uh, ahead. What's your advice for Michael? So, Michael, I'm delighted to be able to give you some good news just for a change. I feel as if I've done nothing but give bad news today. But no, after you have an MRI scan, you certainly shouldn't 
have to isolate for 14 days. That would only be if you'd been in contact with somebody who was confirmed as having coronavirus. Hospitals are being really careful. They're keeping their clean areas clean and they're trying very hard to ensure that the risk in those areas is as low as it humanly can be. So you're at no more risk, I would say, in an MRI department than you are in any other area where you come into contact with people and possibly at even lower risk. Therefore, no, go have your MRI scan. You will probably find that the staff there will be wearing masks. That's to protect you. If you want to wear a mask, that's fine. That would be protecting them, not yourself. But when you come home, you don't need to self-isolate. Good news for Michael there and a good place to end Dr. Sarah Jarvis. And Simon Calder, thank you very much. We'll have more next Monday at 8.30. Thank you. Bye-bye.